Anyways, so uh, yeah, if you're wondering what I'm doing here, uh, it was a last minute decision to come home. Uh, some of you know my mom passed away this past summer, and uh, so we were just here like a few months ago. I think we left in October. So it was uh, kind of a last minute thing between my wife and I that I should come home and be with my dad for Christmas. So, you know, that's why I'm here. And it was a good time, good visit, and uh, everybody's like, oh, hey, where's your wife? So it's like, <laughs> thank you. But... So she didn't come, so she's, uh, they, uh, she went with some other missionaries after. We do a week of outreach during the Christmas season, because, like, in Thailand, you know, Christmas is the birth of Santa. So, I mean, I mean, people don't even know who Jesus is. So, I mean, if they know anything about it, it's around Christmas time. So Christmas, we do uh, a week of outreach during the Christmas week, and they go into the slums, give toys, they go to the hospital, pray for kids, you know, all kind of ministries like that. And then they have a break, so she's on a beach somewhere with some other missionaries right now, suffering for the Lord, and uh, here I am, and this, my goodness, crazy. Yeah, it's been a crazy uh, couple, um, few months here, you know, just the season of our lives that's been crazy in the summer, and then we landed in Thailand, and it's been, you know, we hit the ground running as soon as we got there. I'm in and out at different time zones, and I don't know if I'm coming or going. My wife found a burrito in my son's crib, and she's like, what is there a burrito in the crib? And I'm like, I hope I didn't put my son in the microwave. You know, it's just, it's been crazy. Mm, tough crowd. All right. <laughs> But uh, yeah, actually, just before I came to Canada, I was in India for two weeks, and um, we started, uh, one of my students from Thailand, we train guys in our Bible school in Thailand from all over Asia, predominantly all over the world guys come, but our one guy from India, he came for two years, and he went back, he planted a Bible school, and he's got, you know, 30 guys in his school from all over India, and uh, just a young man. He got some vision. God touched his life when he was in Thailand, gave him a purpose. He went back there, and uh, he started this school. And I went there to teach for two weeks, and uh, I was just amazed at this young man's integrity, at his vision, you know. And he got all these guys from all over India. They don't speak the same language in India, right? So you got all these guys. So the school's in English, and you got all these guys. They can't communicate to one another because they don't speak the same language, but... Whether, no matter where you come from in India, everybody does this. And by the end of the two weeks, I was doing that too. And curry every day, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner was curry. I mean, by the end, it was like coming out my nose. I felt like, like the children of Israel, you know, when they asked for meat. I love curry, but by the end of the two weeks, it was like, man, alive. They even put it in their chip flavor. Even their toothpaste, now with curry flavor. It's like, wow, you guys love your curry. So by the end of the two weeks, I'm like, my heart is like begging me for mercy. I just wanted to eat a salad. But it was a good two weeks. And I'm really proud of my guy and uh, what he's doing there. And uh, a lot of you guys have prayed for that and given into that and very excited about that. And uh, I'll go back there in March. And then uh, coming up in just two weeks after I leave here next week, uh, Pastor Al and I will be going into Pakistan to do a, a leadership training conference there. So excited about that. And then I will head to Nepal shortly after that because we got another graduate from our school. who well, He started a Bible school as well. So I will do two weeks in Nepal. And then we have our annual jungle trip with our students in Thailand, head into the jungle for two weeks, and then I will go back to India. <sighs> and then I will... Uh, We'll be done. School for the school year, and then we start seven weeks. So it's crazy, but uh, I love it. So if anybody's looking for anything to do this winter and uh, you want to come to India or something, let me know. All right? Lots of things to do. Lots of exciting ministries happening all over Asia. People getting saved. Uh, lots of things I could sit here for an hour and tell you about. But uh, I want to share God's Word with you guys today. Amen? Everybody's got their Bibles? Yeah? Yeah, oh, bring your Bible to church, good stuff, or your phone, or however we do it these days. Okay, uh, yeah, this morning I got something, it's been burning in my heart, it's, uh, for some of you, might, you've heard this a thousand times, for some of you it might be new, uh, if you're like me, sometimes you just need to be reminded of the, the main things, amen? Right, the gospel, for example, is the greatest revelation that we will ever receive, and we'll probably spend 
our whole eternity just getting to know the gospel more and more. Amen? Okay, the gospel is not basic Christianity where I enter my relationship with Jesus and then I move on to greater spiritual things. The gospel is the power, right, Paul said. It is the power of salvation, is this gospel. Amen? Gospel means good news. So this morning, I want to talk a little bit about that. Okay, as we enter into our new year, right, and everybody's making resolutions and, you know, I mean, some of them are good, right? I resolve to eat better or exercise or whatever it is, not watch as much TV, whatever we, we, we do. I mean, those things can be good, right? But we need something that will change our life, right? Not just the outside, but the inside, right? The heart of a man must change before a man can change, amen? Not the outward. So I want to talk about that. So I got some good news and I got some bad news. What do you guys want first? The good news or the bad news? The bad news? Okay. I'll give you the bad news and then I'll give you the good news. It'll cheer us up and we'll go eat lunch and we'll be, we'll be good, amen? Okay, the bad news is we all have a disease, okay? Everybody has this disease. In fact, you're born with this disease, okay? This disease is called sin, sin nature, right? Everybody has this disease. Now, it looks different in every person. It manifests itself different in everybody, but we all suffer from this disease, amen? The Bible makes this clear. Romans the book of Romans, Paul talks about this first half a dozen chapters, right? He's shooting down every argument that people are making to try to be righteous before God by whether by doing works or uh, just being born in the right place at the right time or under the right people. And Paul, he spends his time shooting down this argument about being righteous. I mean, you read Romans chapter 1, I think verse 18 to 32 Paul lists everything, the characteristics of a corrupted human being, right? The sinful nature, the man without God, okay? So whether we're born into a Christian home or a Christian country, we all suffer from this disease of sin, right? We can agree on that. This is uh, pretty standard Bible basic stuff. But in our day and age, excuse me, in our day and age, our, our religious thinking, a lot of different religions, our humanistic thinking, wants to believe that man is inherently good. He just does evil, right? I'm a good person, but somewhere along the road, I got sidetracked, and now I'm doing evil. But we know from the scriptures, this is not true, right? Romans chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, he says that no one is righteous, not one. Right? There's no one who does good. Nobody. This is, he's talking about the man who is not in Christ. This is the, the condition that we are born into, right? Uh, my son, you know, a little while back, he got into a fight. He's one and a half years old. And he got into a fight in the nursery and bit a kid over a toy. Where did he learn that? I didn't teach him that. I don't go around biting his mom. And then he's thinking, oh, I'm going to try that at the nursery. No, it, it, it is... It is inside the person, right? Kids know they fight from the time they're little babies, right? Because we are doomed from the get-go, right? Because we are fallen, right? Romans chapter 5, uh, he talks about that, about Adam. Through one man's sin comes sin for all men, right? Through one man's act of unrighteousness, all are made unrighteous. But this is hard for our uh, fuzzy thinking of today. This is hard for our humanistic idea today because we don't want to believe that we are evil people. But the reality is we are spiritually dead and we are corrupted in our nature, right? It's not that we become, but that we are, right? Right? I'm not a sinner because I sin. I sin because by nature I'm a sinner, right? And this is every person in the world, black, white, whatever, no matter where you come from, what kind of country you're born into, right? This is 
what we are. And we need to face this. As, as people, we need to understand this because this will help us in the future to understand the power of the gospel, how much we actually need the blood of Jesus on our life. Okay, sin is never something that we need to take lightly in our life, right? Okay, I'm not going to talk too much about sin, okay, because there is good news. But we need to understand this, right? Because we can preach a gospel and, you know, kind of fluff it up and put some sugar on the top, you know. You just need to, you need to repent and then it's going to be good. But actually, the reality is, without Christ, we are wicked, evil, and depraved. And God's wrath is upon us. Right? This is the seriousness of why people need to get born again. Right? And this is what born again means. Spiritually, we are dead. From the time of Adam, all men are spiritually dead. And right? Jesus says you must be born again. Right? Our spirits must be born again to God so that we can have right relationship with God. Okay? So we all suffer from this disease. And it manifests itself different in every person. Right? Some of us lie, some of us cheat, steal, hurt other people, whatever it might be, right? It's like any other disease. A few years back, I had uh, dengue fever. I got stung by a mosquito, and it's like malaria, and, you know, for a couple weeks, everything's cool, and then you see every day you get a little bit more tired, a little bit more tired until one day we, we flew in from, I think, Malaysia or something, and we landed, and we were taking the bus back, and I passed out on the bus. And my body, just in an instant, just, right? Sin is like this. Eventually, I mean, everything might look good on the outside, but eventually what is on the inside will manifest itself, right? And then, you know, like a disease, you get chills, you get a runny nose, you get the fever, you get whatever it is, right? Your kidneys start to shut down, right, with dengue fever. Your actual condition becomes reality, right? And like sin, you cannot hide it. You can mask it, cover it up, but eventually what you are will become evident, right? But in our society today, in our new age kind of thinking, in in a religious idea, right? Religion is, pure religion is good, but religion, generally speaking, is, is not. It's like a doctor, right? A doctor doesn't actually heal you, he just treats you, right? And religion is like this. It only tries to treat the symptoms of a greater problem, right? If I have dengue fever, my problem is not a fever. It's inside my body is attacking itself, right? But in our, in our day and age, when people are in sin, we try to treat the symptoms, right? right? The problem is not gun control. The problem is broken people that are doing evil things, with a gun or whatever. I mean, gun control and all that can be good, but the problem is an inward problem, okay? But we like to treat the symptoms. We like to put a Band-Aid on what is an internal thing, right? And if we're not careful, we get caught in that trap of religion and we start to try to fix our outward problem when actually the problem is inward, right? And religion says that to us, doesn't it? All you got to do is try harder. All you got to do is just read your Bible more. All you got to do is just, just do your best. When actually inside we are, are dying and we are sick and the wrath of God is on us, right? And this is the deception of religion. Okay, we preach the gospel in a lot of these other nations in the world where, you know, it, we don't see it too much here, but we see religion in its its fullness, if you will, right? I just came from India, probably the most religious place in the world, and you see people do all kinds of things to try to be right with God, right? Isn't this the goal of all religions, is to become right with God? Isn't that what every human wants? He wants to be right with his maker, And he doesn't know how, so he goes through all these things that will hopefully lead him into right relationship with God. And we come from India, and while I was there in the south, they have this festival. I can't even begin to pronounce it. It's like 35 letters long, and there's no vowels. But they, these guys, they wear black for two months, right? They eat only vegetables. They don't consume any alcohol. They don't cut their hair, and they don't wear any shoes, And at the end of the two months, they walk from where I was in Hyderabad 
all the way, it's like 2,000 kilometers to a other city in a other state, Kerala. And then they walk there, they do their prayers, and then they go back to living their life like they did 10 months ago or whatever, right? Drinking, carrying on. Because in their conscience, though, they've done their religious duty, and it, they feel that it makes them right with God. I mean, you go there, and people are uh, they're impaling themselves, right? All in the name of religion. I mean, you go to the Philippines, there's guys that crucify themselves every Easter. Christian people, right? So, I mean, it's no different. Because all these people are trying to get right with God. I mean, they even go to the extent where they sacrifice children. Because they want to become right with God. And religion tells you, you just keep doing this stuff and you will become right with God. But it does nothing for our conscience, right? Because we know after we've done all these things, and we've done them all too, right? We've prayed harder, we've gone to church, and, you know, it, in our conscience we know that something still is not right, right? It doesn't, doesn't do anything for the conscience. Outwardly, it might help us for a while, but inwardly we're still wondering and questioning, right? It doesn't suffice, okay? And this is the deception of religion, right? And it happens to Christian people too in, in, in the West, right? We deceive ourselves to think that if I can just get a bit more religious, everything's going to be, be good and my relationship with God is going to be right. But it's not true, right? It's not true. We need something more than that, okay? So that's the bad news. We all have this disease, that we suffer from, right? This sin nature, and we are corrupt from even before we were born, right? Even David said, even from my mother's womb, right? I have been corrupted. I'm sinful from my mother's womb. So we all have this problem. We don't want to ever downplay this, okay? Especially when we're preaching the gospel, right? All you need is Jesus, right? You have a bigger problem. I mean, all you need is Jesus, but it, 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 there's more to the story, okay? Now, we don't want to use religion as a, as a medicine or as a remedy, okay? Because religion doesn't, it just turns us into people that are doing things that God has not commanded us, right? Jesus plus this, this, and this, and you'll be okay. That's not, that's not the equation, right? We know that's not the equation, okay? So that's the bad news. We have this disease, and we see it all over the world, people doing crazy things, because of their corrupted nature. I mean, I used to, we have this city about a half an hour down the road from where we live in Thailand called Pattaya, and it's known as the sin city of, of Asia, even one of the top sin cities of the world. And we would go there and do ministry, and anything that you could imagine happens, happens in this place. Like, after I went to this place, you know, I am not surprised at what a man can do right? Never put anything past the human being to do that is wicked and evil, okay? So we would go to this place, and we would do ministry, and I would really get angry at all these guys, mostly foreign guys that would come, and they would violate these people, and, you know, just, just horrific things, right? And I would be very shocked. How could these people do this, you know? How could a human do this to another human being? And I mean, there are both two sides to the story and whatever, right? And then I, one day, the Word of God spoke to me and said, how would you expect them to act? They are just being true to their nature, right? How would we expect a corrupted person to act? Of course, they will act corrupt, amen? So when we see things happening in the world, we should not be shocked at, how could this happen? How could a guy do this? How could a guy go into this place and do that? Well, without Jesus, he's only being true to his nature, right? Right? So this should not be a shock to us at all, right? Now, if someone who claims to have a regenerated nature does these kind of things, then you could be shocked. But a person that has no Christ in his life, I mean, he's just, the, you know, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree, amen? Right? Amen? You guys are tracking with me here? Okay. This is a serious thing that is plaguing our, our world. Okay. So the idea of, of this, okay, and I'm going to get to the good news here. The idea is that we don't want to use religion 
to cure what is the real problem, okay? It has to go deeper than that, right? So the idea for us, even as Christians, as we come into the New Year's, we're going to make resolutions, right? My, one of my resolutions, if you will, is I, I need to read my Bible more, like more, right? And religion will tell you, yeah, yeah, do that, and it's going to be okay. I mean, religion, I could read my Bible for 10 hours, and religion will come and say, you should have read it 12 hours, right? So, I mean, I don't want to go by that, right? We want to be diligent in reading our Bible. We want to be diligent in our praying. We want to be diligent in our giving and in our church attendance and our fellowship, right? But not as a means to appease our guilty conscience. How many Christians walk around with guilt? Because they feel like they don't measure up to other people or to what they think they should be, and they carry around condemnation, right? Religion doesn't do anything for our guilty conscience. It just condemns us of where we fail. So, all, like we see in the world, people attempting to appease their conscience by doing all these religious acts, right? And Hebrews says that the blood of Christ cleanses our conscience, from dead works. And this is what the blood of Jesus wants to do, because even in the Old Testament, every year they would bring a goat out, or a sheep, and they would lay their sin on the goat, and then they would kill the goat or put him back out into the woods, right? And their sins were forgiven, but they still carried around the guilt of their sin. Every year they have to remember their guilt, remember their sin. But with with the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? That cleanses us from that guilt, okay? Because we're forgiven, but a lot of Christian people are still trying to earn their salvation, right? I mean, I'm guilty at this from time to time. If I just win more souls, if I just, you know, get up earlier and pray, and this and this, like I'm trying to earn favor from God. Those things are good, but we sometimes use them as a way to find acceptance from God. And it doesn't matter how long you are in the Lord, we all we stumble at this point from time to time, right? But we need to allow the blood of Jesus to cleanse our conscience from guilt, right? Because God says, I remember your sin no more, right? David, King David said, and in, in Paul quotes him in the book of Romans, that blessed is the man whose trans- transgressions are forgiven, who God does not count his sins against him. That's good news, Right? So, I mean, we sin, and we need to be uh, responsible for our sin, but we don't need to carry that burden around, right? Because God forgot it. Why do I remember it? And I carry that and bring condemnation, and I try to get more religious because I think that will help me when it doesn't, okay? So we don't want to, the point is not to be religious, not to do things with activity of religion that we think will appease our conscience, or help us get right with God, right? We see this all over the world, and religion causes people to do crazy things, okay? So the good news, okay? The good news is there is a cure, okay? Anybody know the cure? Jesus. It's a squirrel. But I will also accept Jesus. Okay, Okay, it's a no-brainer. Jesus is the cure, okay? But moreover, the cure is having an understanding of righteousness, okay? This, is, this revelation changed my life, okay? Because when I was a young Christian, I thought, you know, salvation meant my sins were forgiven. But actually, salvation means more than just forgiven sin. It really does. That's where it begins, Okay, salvation means that my relationship with God has been restored. Amen? That's what righteousness means. It's that I am right with God, and God is right with me. Because before that, there was animosity between us. Okay, it wasn't like God is up there thinking, I just wish Chris would just come, you know. There, the Bible says we were enemies. Now God... His love overrides all that. The Bible says that God so loved the world, He sent His only Son. But as a sinner, as an unrighteous man, I have no business being in the presence of a holy God, right? So there was a problem between God and I, right? Even while we were still enemies, the Bible says, right? 
So when I get this revelation of, of righteousness, right? Salvation equals righteousness. The re relationship between me and God is restored. Now I can come boldly before the throne of grace and receive mercy and help in my time of need without feeling any condemnation because God sees me as righteous. Amen? Because the problem is, if we don't have this idea of righteous, we still feel condemned or sinful in the presence of a holy God. So in, instead of going to God for mercy, we, we run away from God because we think we ha serve this God who is up there looking to get us. Amen? So if we can understand this revelation of righteousness, right? That this supernatural, by faith act, God declares the unrighteous man as righteous. Okay? The guys spend their whole lives studying this stuff. I can't hit it all in just a half an hour. But think about this. The Bible says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that God gives you a new nature when you become a Christian. Right? That God puts in you a new nature. That you are no longer the sinner, fallen, condemned person. That you are now born anew of God. This is what salvation is. Right? And then he goes on to say in, in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that God made Jesus, who didn't know any sin, he was perfect, become sin for me so that I can become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Now, this verse, it blows my mind. This is my favorite verse. God made Jesus, who was perfect, didn't deserve any punishment. God made him sin. Think about that. It doesn't say God put sin on Jesus. It said God made Jesus sin for me so that I can become the righteousness of God. This is the gospel. This is the good news of the gospel. This is what cleanses our conscience from, from dead works. This is what cures the doctor of religion. This is what hits the inner man. Now I stand before God as righteous. This is amazing. So that when God sees me, he sees righteousness. Not because I'm such a good Christian or a deadly guy or go to Thailand. No, 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 no. But because Jesus paid the price for me. Okay, now we might, oh, this is the gospel. I heard this many times. But if we could get this revelation that God views me as righteous, that me and him are, we're okay. There's no problem between us, right? So when God sees me, he sees, he doesn't see my sin. He doesn't see my faults. He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And this is good news for me because now I don't have to worry about me. I don't got to worry about my efforts to please God. I'm looking to Jesus. Now, out of this revelation should flow a life and service of love, of commitment, right, of passion, not as a means to earn the favor of God, but as a response to this, this wonderful good news. Amen? Right? This is great news. Right? Because all, of, all religions in the world is trying to find righteousness. They're trying to find right relationship with God. And Paul says in Romans 3, uh, 21, that he says, Now there is a righteousness from God. Right? A righteousness that God will accept from us. And the good news is it has nothing to do with us. It has all to do with Jesus. That God made him sin. Right? God is serious that we get this righteousness revelation in our brains, instead of walking around and in our hearts, instead of walking around condemned all the time, to the fact that even, you know, Isaiah 53 says that God was the one who crushed Jesus. God kills his own son. You can look it up. Isaiah 53, verse 10. It pleased God to crush him. This is how serious God is about getting this into us, right? Because it's not enough just for us to have forgiveness, if we still have a guilty conscience, right? God wants a new creation out of us, right? That we walk around with that revelation of righteousness. See, because religion will tell us that you, in order to bring glory to God, you should be a worm and you should be down in the dirt and be humble because this will bring glory to God. 
And I hear this a lot. We preach in a lot of different denominations, and you hear this a lot. Oh, I'm just a lowly man, and I'm unworthy. And Well, in yourself, you totally are correct. But quit looking at yourself, right? God didn't call you to be a worm. God gets more glory from us when we stand in our righteousness, the finished work of Jesus Christ, doesn't he? Instead of, yeah, I'm just a worm, lowly, and I'm not worthy of anything. Well, then, if that's the case, what did Jesus do for you? If you still have this idea, right? We need to get this revelation that I am the righteousness of God. Then I have boldness. And then when I go to God and pray, I'm not feeling condemned or anything, right? There's a right relationship between us, right? I no longer go from, I go from the wrath of God to the sonship of God, right? And how God doesn't treat his children bad. We, the Bible says, how you are a sinner, you even give your kids good gifts. How much more so will God give you who is perfect, right? Right? I don't break my son's arm to teach him a lesson, right? I don't give him bad things to try to make him more spiritual, right? We serve a good God. Now I can come before this God with confidence, with joy, not all in in fear. I mean, there are times, obviously, we come before God with awe and fear, but I mean, we are, the Bible calls us sons of God, co-heirs with Christ, that everything that God gives Jesus, he gives to me because we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, right? No more condemnation, right? Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is that, therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, who walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh, right? By faith, we have to see ourselves as righteous. Romans chapter 4 says that Abraham, by faith, believed God, and God credited him as righteous. But for religion, it, it's hard to believe this because we feel like we have to do something in order to earn God's love. So if you tell somebody, all you got to do is just believe the gospel. Well, and then what? Then I, I should be doing this. Should I walk around with no shoes on? Should I never cut my hair? right? And we try to do all these things when God says, just believe the gospel. Amen? Just believe. And by faith, you are made righteous. But we need to get this revelation, right? And I guarantee it'll change your life. It changed my life because for so long I felt condemned because my efforts weren't good enough. Or we go to the mission field and missionaries, other missionaries are winning hundreds and thousands to the Lord and planting churches. And we're seeing one or two converts a year. And you begin to judge yourself and feel condemned because what is going on? You can't, you can't live like that. I didn't sign up for this to live like that. I had enough guilt and condemnation before I became a Christian. I don't need God giving me more. Right? But the choice is ours. We need to choose whether we are going to be righteous or whether or not we are going to accept that, right? That's why I find this, this idea, I find it hard to buy into that I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I, I, I find that hard to buy into. At one point in my life, I was a sinner saved by grace, but now I am the righteousness of God. I can't be both. I have to choose. Am I a sinner or am I righteous? In myself, yeah, I am a sinner. Yeah, there's no debate about that. But I'm not looking at myself. Are you righteous or are you a sinner? You can't be both. And the Bible makes it clear. Where do sinners go? Yeah. Right? Okay? Only righteous people, the Bible says, can stand before God. But our, our idea is to get this, this revelation. Okay, so when we come into the new year, let's not make a new year's resolution. Let's get a new year's revelation. Okay, my point in the new year is not to try harder or to be a better person, right? My point in the new year is to get closer to Jesus so that I don't have to look at me. Okay? Because if I do anything in my own strength, trust me, I know me. You want to know what kind of real man I am? Ask my wife. My point is to get closer to Jesus. Okay? And then I don't have to at measure up. I don't have to look good because I'm looking to Jesus. 
And out of that relationship will flow all other things. More passionate service. I'll love my wife more. I'll read my Bible more. Because I want to. Not because I feel like it's my religious duty to read my Bible. To appease my conscience. Right? I mean, there the day goes by, you don't read your Bible, you feel, oh, I should have read my Bible. Right? God's, God's love for you doesn't change because you didn't read your Bible. Now, should you read your Bible? Three people said yes. <laughs> Amen. I mean, there are things that we should do, right? But underlying all of it, God's love for me is not dependent on how well I perform for Him. Because He already performed for me. And that's what sets Christianity apart from every other religion in the world. Because every other religion, man is working his way to please God. But in Christianity, and this is why people hate it, it's because it's exclusive. God does the work to save the man, not man working to save himself. So when we say Jesus is the only way, they can't accept it because religion kicks in and we, there must be something we have to do, right? And they, they won't accept, they, they get angry at it, right? But by faith, we just believe the gospel, right? By faith, I am righteous. By faith, when God looks at me, he sees Jesus. He doesn't see my fault. He doesn't see my sin, right? And when I do sin, the Bible says, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, right? That if we sin, we confess our sin. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and restore righteousness to us, right? We do that not for God's purpose, but for our own purpose, Right? Because we don't want to make light of sin any time in our life. But I tell you what, the more I have a revelation of righteousness, the more I draw closer to Jesus, the less and less I do things I shouldn't do. Right? But I tell you what, if I don't read my Bible for two, three, four, five days, I'll backslide worse than anybody I know. Right? My thinking begins to slide. Right? Paul says in Romans that we must renew our mind every day, right? Wash your, your brain with the Word of God, right? And this has to happen on a daily basis, right? When we get born again, our spirit is renewed, right? That doesn't change. But we live in a body that is made of flesh, and we have emotions and feelings that aren't regenerate, that we need to daily improve, and that comes through reading the Bible. That comes through getting a new mind, right? That I have the mind of Christ, right? So when we read a verse like in Isaiah where he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, they can be, right? God's talking to backslidden people in that verse, right? But the Bible says, I have the mind of Christ. So if I get closer to Jesus, my ways should be the ways of God. My thoughts should be the thoughts of God, should they not? Because I'm becoming what I'm feeding myself on, okay? So guys, this year, as we enter into the 2013, right? According to the Jetsons, we should have been driving and flying cars by now. <laughs> 2020, maybe. Right? We don't want to try harder. We want to get closer to Jesus, right? We want to make the time for the Lord this year. Amen? Not find the time. Right? We find time to do lots of things. I make time to do things. But when it comes to Jesus, I got to find time. Oh, I got 10 minutes before bed and think, right? No, he falls asleep. Right? Make the time for the Lord this year. Okay? I'm getting older than I used to be. Right? But I realize, I'm not so old, but I realize as I'm getting older that and things happen in life, that time is very short. And, you know, things don't fulfill you at, like they used to. And the only thing that is always standing there is Jesus, right? And we can distract ourselves with so many things and do all kinds of things that might be religious or try to take our mind away from thinking about God. But as we get older and time is winding down, Jesus is the only thing that makes a difference in our life. I mean, we hear that all the time, but it's so true. 
right? When you're lying in your deathbed and your life is flashing before your eyes, we won't remember what we got for Christmas. I don't remember what I got last year. That was a year ago. I don't think I got anything, but... (laughs) But here we are, you know? Our lives are winding down, and all that matters in eternity is Jesus and our relationship to Him, right? Not our collections, who won the football game. I mean, these things are not evil in themselves, but Jesus matters, right? And if we can get that and make the main thing the main thing, our passion for Him, our passion for eternity, our passion for lost souls, right? Our passion for the nations, our passion for our neighbor, it, it, it becomes such a burning thing in our life that all we want to do is preach the gospel, right? All we want to do is share. I mean, I can talk about this all day because God has, has done work in my life where there's more to my life than, than things. And I mean, being a missionary is not a cure for being cut off from material things. I mean, it's all over the world, right? And if we're not careful, we get distracted by living life we forget what we live life for, right? And it's not bad to have things, but those things have us, and we've wasted our time, and next thing you know, we're in front of Jesus trying to add up our, our change, right? When we should be walking in abundance. Amen? So the good news, guys, what we need to have that revelation of righteousness this year, right? Uh, who we are in Jesus Christ, that I want a relationship with God, this is the most important thing to me, to grow closer and closer to Him as the years go by, right? My idea this year is not to try harder, not to become a better person, pull my socks up, right? I mean, there's things I'm going to do, but it's not going to be out of a motivation of guilt or fear, but one out of love, because Jesus died for me, right? He died for me. I'm going to love my wife more this year because Jesus died for me. I'm going to preach better this year because Jesus died for me. And all of it's going to flow out of that, that God accepts me because of Jesus, right? And if we can get that in our life, it will transform us. No more condemnation, no more guilt. Okay, I'm not talking about sinless perfection or anything like that. I'm talking about standing in, in Jesus, in the finished work of, of, of Christ, not looking at me, not looking at us, because who does? Who wants to do that, right? I want to see Jesus. I do. Amen. So that's the word I got for you uh, today. I appreciate this opportunity. I so appreciate this church. Uh, really, I appreciate the, the app that you guys put out there on the thing. Every Monday on our day off, I go to the coffee shop and listen to the sermons, and I've really... Honestly, I've been really blessed by your preaching. I'm not saying that because I'm here. You already let me speak, so I don't have to butter you up. But really, you guys got a lot of solid teaching coming out of this church. and Yeah. And I've copied your sermons and preached them in the other places. And hey, it doesn't have to be yours. It just has to be true. You know what I mean? The Word of God is the Word of God. Okay. But yeah, so I encourage you guys, you know, with your church, there's a good group of people here and, you know, things are happening and just get behind your leadership and each other and lift each other up and come to the prayer and really, we want to see God do something in our life, don't we? We don't want to waste our life. We want our life to count for something, hopefully for Jesus, right? So let us do what we can, throw aside all these things that hinder us from being unproductive, even good things, you know, and let us fix our eyes on Jesus so that we can run the race with passion, amen, and see people come into the kingdom of God, see our families, our kids growing up to serve the Lord and fear God, amen, isn't isn't this what we want, not to get all religious and humdrum, but to serve God with fire, amen. So, uh, yeah, with that, I just appreciate you guys. We appreciate everybody's prayers as we're in the mission field and uh, serving God in these other nations. It's, it really is a privilege and an honor for us to do this. And, and, and for myself personally, uh, you know, to go to a place 
like India has always been a dream of mine, even before I was a Christian, and then to be able to do it for God. It's just a reminder to me the goodness of God all my life when I stand in India. I was there last uh, two weeks, and I thought, Jesus didn't even preach the gospel in India. And here I am doing that. You know, it, not because I'm a deadly guy, but Jesus, <laughs> Jesus said, you will do greater things. And preaching the gospel in India, for me, is a pretty great thing. Right? So don't ever look past the little things that are happening in your life. Amen? So we appreciate everybody, your prayers and your giving and just everything, that, your friendship, your emails and things like that. They keep us encouraged. And uh, yeah, continue to pray for us as we enter into a, a very busy season of our lives. We're shorthanded in Thailand as far as missionaries go, so we've absorbed a lot of the, the extra, extra ministry. Uh, my wife and I are associate uh, pastoring our international church and uh, doing the traveling, teaching in the Bible school, and uh, yeah, just, you know, trying to raise a son too, and yeah, it's pretty amazing. So uh, we thank everybody for that, and uh, yeah, I like a Christmas present, I'll wrap it up, and <laughs> thank you. Awesome.